Welcome, spies, men in black who work for spies, alien light creatures who are also spies, so many spies, and no black and white one trying to kill each other. This is episode 335 on a, of an unearthly podcast, streaming live on the 1st of January, 2020. Happy New Year. Tonight, we feature Spyfall Part 1, written by Chris Chibnall and starring Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor, Bradley Walsh as Graham O'Brien, Tosin Cole as Ryan Sinclair, and Mandip Gill as Yasmin Khan. I am Bill Sylvia, the Man in Black, and I fear we dated ourselves with that reference. With me are Randy Ronson McCulloch. Most likely. Mad Matt Winchell. I'm drinking Kool-Aid. Tim the Enchanter Sheridan. It's the 20s. Let's bring back the Charleston. And Thomas Fireheart. New Year, better mic quality. Yep. Yeah, that actually goes for both Thomas and Tim, apparently. <laughs> uh, Yay for no thudding mics that are cut out. <laughs> so how was everybody's Christmas for starting? Because we haven't broadcast since the 18th. Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, not too bad. Hectic and I pretty good just, I'm still getting visited stuff. family. <laughs> pretty good. Visited family. Yeah. Got anything good? Oh, uh, I got a DVD collection of uh, the Christopher Eccleston and David Tennant era. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. I so got a lot good. of overtime hours at work. Does that count? No. <laughs> Not particularly. So did Aaron. <laughs> um, I got absolutely nothing Doctor Who related this year. Mm-hmm. Not even a, like not even like a pop figure. Oh, that means I got more Doctor Who stuff than you. I got a mug. Actually a thermos. <laughs> Star Wars I got it, a mug. <laughs> but then again, I got a Nintendo Switch, so I can't argue. <laughs> uh for big stuff that I got, I my brother in law got me Castlevania collection. Uh Aaron uh, got me a Devil May Cry collection that's one through three. Ooh. And I was just given a gift card today for the rest of my Christmas gift for my family. And I've spent it all on the last half season of He-Man I don't own yet. Uh, the Coffin Joe trilogy. And a new copy of Outlaw Star because I have the old Bandai releases which are literally falling apart. It didn't even take them two years before they started to crack. Mm. Those poor, poor DVDs were such garbage cases. <laughs> um, I, I ended up just getting a because uh, there's so many people my parents have to buy for that they just have a fifty dollar limit these days. So I basically tell them if you can't, th- if I don't ask for anything specific, just get me a fifty dollar movie voucher and I'll be good. <laughs> Sorry, that's <laughs> so that's what they got me. And I got my dad like I didn't get paid until like right before Christmas and the shops had shut, so I had to wait until Boxing Day before I could get them anything. So I got my I got my dad a DVD of Once Upon a Time in the West and I got my hmm. mum uh the Power of the Daleks on DVD. <laughs> <laughs> Cuz Patrick Troughton is a favorite doctor and she loves the Daleks, so I figured screw it. She doesn't have this, so. Uh, for the rest of my family, I got my nephew a Mecha Godzilla figure, and then I showed him some live action footage and he was floored. <laughs> um, my younger nephew, uh my mother had some spare gifts left over. I decided to out of the pile to grab a DVD of The Hungry Caterpillar. <clears throat> Um, they are apparently putting those stories to DVD now, which is nice. Those are nice old classics. Um, yeah, I think I remember those too, because I think mm-hmm. uh, those have been around a while, even before me. Yeah, I know. My uh, father, I got the Rambo trilogy. Yeah, uh, the Rambo not trilogy, the series. Mm. Um, it was a nice cheap box set. I'm like, yeah, this will work. <laughs> And for my say, mother, get... my mother is a Hitchcock say... fan, so I got her rear window. Oh, nice. <clears throat> yeah, 
Yeah, I was going to say you'd want to get a rock, like a Rocky. Ah, uh, sorry, not Rocky Rambo box set now because there'll be another expensive one when the the newest one finally comes out. On I, I'm on not newest. sure if the newest one was in there or not. Even if it isn't in there, it doesn't matter. It's only one spare DVD out of the rest of them. Yeah. I uh, see. It always drives me crazy when I have a box set and then a new disc comes out that's not in it. <laughs> and I'm like, well, now I need to throw the whole box set out and start over. <laughs> Yeah, like I I have like no 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 I'm too poor for that. All of the, yeah, I have like all of the I have a, like a collection of all the, all the Bond movies up to Skyfall, and it's like here's a space for when Spectre comes out, mm. and then when I finally got my dad the box set of all of them last year that included Spectre, so it's like oh you've actually got the full set now. Well, well now there <laughs> now there's trailers for a new one, so ah uh, yeah, gotta uh, wait for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And. Finally, the uh, my body's Christmas present to me was apparently a case of the shingles. If you don't, if you don't know, if you don't know what shingles are, they're chicken pox on crack. Mm. If you if you've had chicken pox, you have a ch- about a thirty percent chance of getting shingles, and that's down mm. from fifty percent. Um, but basically, yeah, it stings and it itches and it burns. So I'm basically have that across my neck, which just makes me a wonderful person to deal with. The good news is that Gen Z won't won't have to deal with it because there's a vaccine now, except that Gen Z's parents are anti-vaxxers. Te- and therefore, te- te- fuck te- it, they'll have to deal with it too. Technically, uh, that gives that basically protects you from the chicken pox. I don't know if that will stop you from getting shingles or not. Yeah. Because well, you said you get shingles game. if you if you already got the chicken pox, right? It's but yes, it's See, still the vaccine is you. still a small amount of chicken pox in it, mm. so yeah, it's, it's still possible. the virus. Yeah, because basically shingles is the chicken pox virus going. You know what? It's been several years since we've uh, done anything. Let's get together and have a reunion. <laughs> Let's throw a party and invite everybody. Mm. So shingles is essentially Blues Brothers, only less light. Yeah. <laughs> um. Either way, it's I fortunately caught it within the first seventy-two hours, um, and went to a doctor. So they said, "Yeah, if you start taking the stuff now, it won't be that bad." Thankfully, uh, you got it early enough. You there's a pill for that. Yeah, because <laughs> if you don't catch it, you could technically have it for weeks. Ugh. And um, mm-hmm. apparently, it's uh, it's a seven day uh, pill regimen, and it's supposed to be gone or virtually gone by the end of the seven days. So it's it's the ring for virus, viri. <laughs> well, it was the same oh, kind of thing. It was it was the same kind of thing to clear up my pneumonia. You know, I had pneumonia two months ago. I've got shingles now. My body's just freaking falling apart. It's just. I'm they had to I'm, stick a spigot in you to treat you for pneumonia. Yeah. Nah, they just give you antibiotics now. Oh. Well, be happy they're you're, not you're, trying you're, to bleed you for it. I was gonna say your medical knowledge is really uh, kind of well, 19th century. There. I mean, that, the that is my, my my uncle was saying that's what he, they had to do to treat him for pneumonia was they stuck a spigot in his back. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got a little bit chaotic, uh, archaic, rather, in their doctrine. Where, where, where was he? The backwoods? <laughs> nah, see, if there was the backwoods, they'd have an herb for that. Because, you know, if the problem was he had too much fluid in him, you know, that's, that's what they make Lasix for. And I know all about that shit, because I got to take that, too. Yeah. Uh God, I hate getting old, and I'm only freaking forty something. I shouldn't have to do this stuff until I'm over sixty. God, I hate my body. Can I regenerate, please? I'm sure someone's working on that right now. Let's shoot you with some plasma energy and see what happens. As as long as his name isn't Rassilon. <laughs> yeah, Randy somebody goes from just... Rand to Rassilon. One regeneration. Grand Salon. No. Grand Salon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, on tonight's show, we've got news and birthdays. We've got some geek talk. Um, did I see a review of Shame on there? Yes. yes there is. 
All right. So we've got a review of Shame coming from Bill, it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, do we have a... No, I don't see a score change, so why is that uncovered on our list? Um, and then we're going to have a brief Elements of Doctor Who discussion, which I'm going to warn you, at that point, the rest of the podcast is going to be spoilerific. Yes, we'll, yes, we'll the, try the to remember element to is a spoiler you for again. the end of the episode. Yes. Yeah, I will warn people beforehand. At that point, if you haven't watched Spyfall Part 2, be warned that... Yeah, part, part 1? Or Part 1. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, we're yep. not going to spoil Part 2. We haven't seen it yet. We're not psychic. <laughs> we're in the future. I, <laughs> came, I came from half a week in the future, we're and I just saw it. We're in the future. Just traveled back in time for Monday. <laughs> in the future. <laughs> Future anyway, events like this will if, affect you in the future. If you haven't seen <laughs> Spyfall Part One, then pretty much everything after Geek Talk is, or after the review of Shame, is going to be spoilers. All right, so let's get into the news tonight. Uh, first of all, birthdays. Uh, since we haven't been here to two, uh, for two weeks, we're starting with the 19th of December, and that's the birthday of Matthew Waterhouse, who played Adric from 1981 to 1983. He turned 58. Uh, likewise, Christmas Eve uh, shows the birthday of John Levine, who played Sergeant Benton from 1969 to 1976. And more recently on Big Finish. Mm -hmm. Actually, Waterhouse, too, for that matter. Uh, Christmas sees the birthday of Georgia Tennant, named Moffat. There's a trend. Who, play who played Jenny in The Doctor's Daughter, who's also David Tennant's wife and Peter Davidson's daughter. She turned 35. Uh, tw the 27th of December saw the birthday of Christopher Benjamin, who played Henry Gordon Diego, both in uh, The Talents of Wang Chiang and most recently in Big Finish. He turned 85. He is, of course, the last survivor of Jago and Lightfoot. And then finally, on the 29th of December, is the birthday of Bernard Cribbins, who played Wilfred Mott. He turned 92. And again, everybody that was on our list is still alive. Yay. Yay. And that's going to take us straight into uh, episode news. Episode news for episode two, Spyfall Part 2. According to the Radio Times, Spyfall Part 2 will contain three historical figures played by guest stars. Included in the episode are the following. Noor Inyat Khan, played by Aurora Morian. Inyat Khan was a British Women's Auxiliary Air Force Service member of Indian and American descent, trained for wireless operation and fluent in French. She became the first female wireless operator to be sent from Britain into occupied France to aid the French resistance during World War II, and is Britain's first Muslim war heroine. Hmm. Charles Babbage, played by Mark Dexter. Babbage was an English polymath, mathematician, philosopher, inventor, and mechanical engineer, credited with inventing the first mechanical computer, which eventually led to more complex electronic designs. This is not Dexter's first rodeo in Doctor Who, as he played Charlotte Lux's father in Silence in the Library. Ada Lovelace, hmm. played by Sylvie Briggs. Lovelace was an ex English mathematician and writer, chiefly known for her work on Charles Babbage's analytical engine. She was the first to recognize that the machine had applications beyond pure calculation. She was also the daughter of poet Lord Byron. And included is the rest of the cast. List which includes... Najia Khan, played by Shabna Gulati. Hakim Khan, played by Ravin J. Ganatra. Sonia Khan, played by Bavnisha Parmar. Daniel Barton's mother, played by Blanche Williams. Perkins, played by Kenneth J. Inventor, played by Andrew Piper. Airport worker, played by Tom Ashley. And finally, a synopsis. Airport worker sounds like a very important character. <laughs> <laughs> Following an absolutely massive cliffhanger at the end of the previous episode, fans could be wondering how on earth the Doctor and her fam could possibly get back on their feet. But in this week's adventure, that's exactly what they try and do, with the Time Lord and her team facing an incredibly deadly alliance 
and escaping fiendish traps in a last ditch attempt to save humanity. After last night, after last week's bright and all action opener, this is a darker and moodier episode, both visually and tonally, brought to life by the Bay's Lee Haven Jones from a script by Chris Chibnall. And don't worry, even following the first episode, there are sure to be some pretty big surprises. Yeah, we're going to have to. There already weren't some. <laughs> So, yeah, the cons in there, of course, is Yasmin's family. So they'll be coming back again. Yeah. And uh, as for the others, it looks like it's not too big of an additional cast, but we'll see what's going on. I just had this idea that maybe the airport worker is uh, a, a new Time Lord character, but after they <laughs> chose the Doctor and the Master and uh, the the monk, you know, it's like they ran out of of occupations and titles, so like he, he well, gets no, just you, stuck you, with you the forgot, airport You worker. forgot the Ronnie. I, oh yeah, the Ronnie. Yeah. I was going to be the warlord, but that was taken. Yes. So was the war chief. <laughs> um, <laughs> then this other alien guy got to be the editor. Damn it, I really wanted that one. <laughs> I, 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 I suppose be the inventor. <laughs> I suppose I could be the bachelor, but oh wait, no, there's a whole freaking reality show that's called that. I don't want to be associated with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm waiting for a time lord named the Baccalaureate though. With the the original name of bachelor's degree. Um mm. uh, mm. Yes. The asso the associate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I mean, according to the Dalek, there's been plenty of those already. The Daleks, there's been plenty of those already. Mm. Okay. All also right. has some news about episode three, Orphan Fifty Five. Speaking of synopsis and catalyst, we have one for episode three as well, as well as the title of the episode, Orphan Fifty Five. Having decided that everyone could do with a holiday, the doctor takes Graham, Yasmin, Ryan to a luxury resort for a spot of rest and relaxation. However, they discover... Excuse me. <clears throat> However, they discover the place where they are having a break is hiding a number of deadly secrets. What are the ferocious monsters that are attacking Tranquility Spa? The doctor should know by now, taking somebody on vacation never leads to a vacation. <laughs> Although, to be fair, in at least one time, it led to the doctor being attacked by a monster, but the companion having a vacation. True that. <laughs> yep. Actually, Laura they did Fraser, successfully have a vacation name. one time for about a day or two. <laughs> Is this the Romans? No. Oh. I, was, I was talking about when they finally reached the eye of Orion. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then they freaking got and the then a little while, Yeah, a few days into it, all of a sudden they got abducted and got thrown into the war games. <laughs> yeah. So the last real vacation was the Romans. Yep. I guess that a vacation? They got attacked after that, during that too, so... Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... All vacations end in disaster for the Doctor. <laughs> Because you're the doctor, you wind up in a pit of vampire monkeys. Why are yeah. they vampire monkeys? Don't even ask. There's a reason, but we'll tell you about it later. All right. Yeah, so in uh, episode three, Laura Fraser plays Kane, James Buckley plays Nevi, and written it's written by Ed Hime, who also wrote series 11's It Takes You Away. And it's directed by Lee Haven Jones, who also directed Spyfall Part 2. That's really all we know about episode three thus far, but yeah. it's still more than we knew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have a little bit of news of episode eight. Speaking with CTV magazine, Chris Chibnall said the following. Maxine Alderton, who's written episode eight, was very passionate about something I will not tell you about. Ha ha ha. I can tell you what the subject matter is. Anyway, watch episode eight. It's amazing. It's really good. And when we can tell you about it, we will. But you came in with that idea, that group of characters in that setting, ellipses. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah, but, um... Yeah, somebody speculated that might be the Cyberman episode, but we don't know for certain. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it was the mirror that speculated it. And, like, I trust the mirror. <laughs> mm. 
Like, they can trust a news source half the time. Unless they actually source their news. Usually the Radio Times, when it comes to things like this, is usually good. Um, when it comes to usually, wild speculation not always. during production, <laughs> not, they're usually worse when they're, when they're making speculations during production. Mm -hmm. But when they start to give you information just prior to the series coming out, that's usually pretty accurate because that's usually where they start. That's usually one of the places they start blitzing information to. Yeah. All right. So that's all the Series 12 news we know thus far. It, it, mm -hmm. it says something about the fact that the series has already started and we're still getting these bits and pieces about episodes that we don't even have titles for. <laughs> yeah. The fact is that we only know episodes up to episode three. Do you remember under Moffat where he would give you a photo or something that had mm -hmm. the leaked episode names like as books? Mm -hmm. I was going to say, do you remember when we used to meet in August and have a panel with all of the episode titles, who was writing and directing them, <laughs> and yep. we could speculate based on the writer and director's histories? Yes. <laughs> oh, those were the days. Those now we've got days. now we've got Chip Mullen. He's a paranoid cuss. I mean, to be fair, in this particular episode, that worked to his advantage. To be honest, yes, that has actually worked to his advantage. This episode was a complete and total surprise. Yes, it really was, but we'll talk about mm -hmm. that later. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, no, so we'll, go to, we'll go to the merchandise section. Yep. Merchandise. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, online merchandise vendor Forbidden Planet will be releasing 10 new Series 12 t-shirts starting tomorrow. Go to ForbiddenPlanet.com tomorrow to check them out. Yeah, there's no news on what they are, just that they're coming out for pre-order tomorrow. So, yeah. Not even a preview for us to, to know what we're what would be pre-ordering. So, blah. <laughs> but still, All that's right. an awful that's an awful lot of new shirts though. Range mm -hmm. of ten Doctor Who TV uh t shirts will launch during the new series themed around each week's episode. <laughs> oh. So it sounds like they're releasing a shirt every week. Now, if only they would release them early so we would know what the episodes were about. <laughs> <laughs> yep. If only. Right, Seems like um... somebody, somebody knows what the episodes are about, just not us. Right. <laughs> Leak them. Leak the shirts. Leak the shirts. <laughs> Hell, you remember when we would go to a panel in August and we would have already seen at least half an episode? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Someone got fired for that. <laughs> uh, All right. Uh, moving on to our next bit. Uh, as with last year, Predict the Ratings is back with winners slated to receive a Series 12 Blu-ray slash DVD upon its release in March. The aim is to predict the Barb's final consolidated ratings for Spyfall Part 1. To enter the competition, please send the following details to comp-ratings at doctorwhonews.net with the subject, no, Doctor, I expect you to ellipses. The details are your name and preferred email address, your country of entry, full details for your address will be requested only if you're the winner and they're sending it to you, uh, your guess at the final viewing figure to the nearest 10,000, uh, the example they give is 9.99 .99 million, your guess at the final position in the chart, uh, such as first, etc., this will only be used in the event in the event of a tiebreaker. Uh, the competition closes at a, uh, 8 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, January 2nd, uh, which is in like three hours, I think. Uh, two only, or three hours, yeah. Only one entry will be accepted per person. The competition is open worldwide. Uh, Barb final figures are expected in early 2020. Um, and the winner will be contacted once they've been published. And the prize is a copy of the Series 12 on either DVD or Blu-ray, which will be confirmed with the winner at the time of notification. Yeah. So, you know, I have been tempted to enter this in the past. I have no clue this year. Yeah, I have no <laughs> idea. This it, the, After the, uh, the mediocre kind of esque season last year, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> after I don't the... know what to expect. With the amount of toxicity in the fan base um, that has all started, all of the fan bases it seems. 
Oh yeah, well there seems to be no fan base that hasn't turned on itself <laughs> in the last yeah. three years. But ever <laughs> since the Whitaker announcement, the there's been you know the anti Who movement in the Doctor Who the fan base, and it was shown last season with the ratings steadily sliding downhill as the as the series went on. Mm. I couldn't even fathom a guess where t- this year's premiere is mm. going to be. I mean, you could almost argue that in a way, the year off, even though the year off gave people time to stew, who didn't like series 11 time to stew on it, it could also give, it also gave them like breathing time to get over it. And it's like, oh shit, there hasn't been Doctor Who for a full year. So they'll actually be willing to give it a shot at this point. Mm. Mm-hmm. So the ratings I, might be better again just because of the gap. Possibly. Or they could be even worse than usual. It's hard to tell. Yeah, we have to I, we have to wait and see how the actual turn up becomes. Yeah, mm. I, I can't even ballpark it this year. Previous years I've been I've I've ballparked a guess, but I've never won, but I've ballparked a guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean they won't have the novelty of a new doctor, so it probably it, I'd be surprised if it did better than the the woman who fell to earth. Yeah, it's well, there, there might be other novelties, but it's not time to talk about that yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, otherwise, you know, there were other things that could change stuff. It's not an anniversary season. It's not mm-hmm. a new Doctor. So, yeah, it's kind of hard to tell. Ugh. Anyway, moving on. Uh, finally, after a couple of years, UK viewers can see d- classic Doctor Who the same way Americans can. Yes, BritBox UK updated its library on Boxing Day to include all of the surviving Classic Who serials. So watch your favorites, or power through them all if you dare, only on BritBox. Woo. Hey, I'm I'm hey, I'm glad that's that's the quality there. Hmm. That there's been a lot of people that are like, well, the Americans have it. Why can't we have it? And I think it was some licensing <laughs> tie-up. Yeah, it would be. I mean, I would have to assume that's the same reason BritBox hasn't launched in any way in Australia yet. I, I would assume that's UN... also why they were struggling to get a few episodes over here, too. Uh-huh. This is why the UN needs some sort of copyright body. And it's not really copyright, it's, yeah, it's licensing. Yeah, it's not copyright, mm. necessarily. They already have plenty of copyright stuff going around. It's Almost to the, the fact chagrin. that <laughs> Doctor Who's coming off of a phase where um, BBC Worldwide would basically pimp it out to anybody to make a book. <laughs> and because of that, there were uh, certain people that had exclusive rights in certain countries. So when BritBox came out... Which That's they, what I mean. If the UN had a specific body that did that, they would be able to use that instead of using different country, specific countries having specific rights. Well, gee, it would still that's... probably fall to that, I think, on some level. Yeah, because that's we're not talking copyright; we're talking licensing. Which, like yeah. I said, if I'm paying you know I'm paying you for this, and that's handled on a country by country basis. If it's not, well, then you know we might as well just go to WorldGov, which you know it's not actually a bad idea. But I was gonna say, yeah, then it would be the 21st century. Yes, it would. <laughs> Then maybe we could abandon um, paper currency and, you know. I'm waiting for that. I am waiting for that. Uh, We've abandoned the gold standard, like, you know, years ago. Is is this the decade, Randy? Is this the decade that we finally go to credits? I'd like to see that. (laughs) The problem is... the, The problem is, who would lead WorldGov at this point? Because I don't want America to do it, because that would put Trump in charge of the entire planet. And I'm pretty yeah. sure everyone else would just kick yeah. him out anyway. <laughs> well, the fact I, I, don't, Trump, I don't know. I, I don't want to. Actually, like I don't Bolsonaro know, Randy. The fact, that, uh, the fact that he would have control means that it's shadow run. <laughs> yeah. The fact is, I don't want the UK to do it, because that would put George, Boris Johnson in charge of the planet. <laughs> and Australia is on fire, and the PM doesn't care, so we don't want him in charge either. <laughs> <laughs> so so what you're saying is that the responsible adult in the room would be Vlad Putin? Oh god. Oh god. Oh, Jesus. 
that's oh, that's, that's a Which, horrific I mean, thought. To be honest, I'm pretty sure he's been working for the past however long he's been in office for, to that end, but yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, talk, better talk than China. Talk about bouncing too far <laughs> right. in the other direction, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Better than North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't think we're quite ready because we don't have the leader that's needed to actually run it. No. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyway, that is our news. We are done with the news. Mm -hmm. Um all of all of the big finish news was just um updates on stuff that we've already announced, so I skipped it. <laughs> we skipped there it. All right, so that means we're going to Geek Talk. Uh huh. I think it does. I, so I have a timer with, ready, um... so three minutes <laughs> each. Uh, we've got time. Do a five okay. each. Do a five each. All right. All right. So okay. Crisis. So for Crisis on Infinite Earths, that includes the majority of the first ha the first half seasons of CW shows I didn't talk about last week. Um. Arrow spent the first half of the season building up to Crisis, dealing with the Monitor, going to different universes, things of that nature. Um, it was pretty much entirely a an extended trailer for Crisis. Um, the Flash was kind of uh, this whole big prepare the team for what happens when the Flash vanishes during Crisis. Um, and Supergirl had kind of its own story. That was the one I was a little better at keeping up with. I mentioned it at one point a few weeks ago. It was kind of an independent story that had nothing to do with Crisis, um, where they kind of beat the first big bad and revealed that there's going to be another big bad for the second half of the season. Um, on to Crisis itself. Um, the first half of the Crisis has aired. Um, it felt a little weird compared to the comics because it feels a little coincidental that so many of these heroes are from these isolated sections of Earth-1. Obviously, that's due to budget constraints, but they did do a good job of getting a lot of universes involved. They got a Batman involved. They got a few Supermen involved, and they worked them in different ways into the story. Um, I think it's been a pretty interesting... Um, and it's definitely a huge crossover, um, definitely challenging any of the claims that the Avengers movies have made in terms of crossovers. Some things are a little hokey, but I've found it entertaining so far. Um, that said, I don't think you really have to be watching all of the shows week to week. To I think you can jump on with Crisis and kind of get the gist of what's going on and get okay. the most important parts. So here's my questions. Okay. How was Tom Welling? Uh, Tom Welling, so how much do you want me to say? I, I don't want you to spoiler what he did. Mm -hmm. How did he perform? How was Tom Welling's um, performance? He performed all right. He was specifically as Clark Kent. Um, and he was there for one scene. I mean, it was a not, enti not a very short scene, not a very long scene either, but it was basically a dialogue scene. Um, okay. Does it does it still feel like Smallville, or were you not? I fan? have never watched Smallville, or maybe, or never more than like half an episode, or more than, or whatever. So I can't really comment on that. Right on the schedule, Clockwork Orange, <laughs> Smallville to build. <laughs> um, uh, we have a new Chuck Mark to make. Okay. Second question: How was Kevin Conroy? Kevin Conroy was great. Um, they kind of lead you to think that he's a certain version of his character that he's actually not. Um, and I'm, it's really hard to talk about that without spoiling what happens during his scene, which I don't want to do. Um, but he, he plays the role he's given very well. Okay. Because we were led to believe that he was Kingdom Come Batman, or Kingdom Come Bruce. It's... They're, they use elements of a lot of different um, of a lot of different Batman universes, but I I don't think he's from any established continuity. Okay. Um, if anything, I would consider him to be a what if of a specific movie, but telling you which movie would spoil that scene. Okay, so he's not from the same universe as um, he's not from the Brandon. same universe as any of the Superman that we meet. Okay. All right, you you can give me that one. All right, mm -hmm. awesome. So he's kind of an amalgamation, Bruce Wayne. Yeah. 
Yeah, pretty much. And when he talks, does he t does he sound like Batman? The Batman we've known and loved from like every freaking animated Batman thing. He from sounds the 90s. more his uh, his role is closer to old Bruce Wayne from uh, Batman Beyond. Old Bruce Wayne still sounded like Batman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes. <laughs> yeah. So basically, yeah. Then. <laughs> I just want to know if when I hear him say I'm going to squee. Ah. <laughs> I think so. 30 okay. seconds, by the way. Hmm. Any more questions? Thoughts? Yeah. Um, final thoughts is that it's halfway through the saga, and I am I want to see what happens next. I think they've been doing a good job. Um, one character has kind of been relegated to comic relief, but he's also had a major role, so I'm kind of waiting to see whether he actually is meaningful at the end or is just there as a dumb comic relief. All okay. right. Five minutes. All right. Um, so the rise of Skywalker, I saw that today and this has been a really heated one. Um, I've seen violent and I'm not exaggerating that opinions from pretty much every corner of the internet on, on, on every possible opinion. <sighs> Um, my opinion on it is that I came away from it uh, feeling better than I did either of the previous two numbered episodes. Um, I don't necessarily agree with all of the story beats they were continuing, but I think they continued them in a fairly good way. Um, they brought certain things back in a way that was meaningful for this story. They set up a new story element. Um, explain you know showed it to you and explained its drawbacks and then used that in a meaningful way that advanced the plot um so ultimately i would say um without spoiling anything in specific that the rise of skywalker was a fair pretty good movie um of, of the of this trilogy uh, I do think it was very timid in the sense that they tried not to disappoint any fans and obviously failed very hard with a lot of things, um, <laughs> by which I mean they tried to they tried to leave enough wiggle room that every possible ship that people have been talking about on the internet all work at the same time, which is not how stories they work. They need to stop. <laughs> they, in other words, um, they, tried, they tried to please all the people. Exactly. They tried and to please everybody. And that leads to nobody being happy. Um, and I forget, mm. there was something other than shipping that they, again, they also tried to please everybody. Um, which, again, you it, it falls flat when you try to do that because it's obviously fake. Mm -hmm. um, it's for shipping. Don't. Stop it. Mm -hmm. Get some help. This, this movie, I say, is the closest to an adaptation of an EU story that we've seen yet. And by adaptation, I mean in the same way that CW or MCU does, not direct adaptation. But it's the closest to an adaptation of the expanded universe that the new trilogy has seen yet. I, um, think our, yet I had I had very specific things I was gonna like DM people as they gave their thoughts on this mm -hmm. to get like yes or no questions so I could talk about spoilers okay. without having to. Right. But instead, because I forgot them all, what I'm going <laughs> to say is do you like what's your stance on the criticism that I've seen and honestly that I have that this feels like they tried to cram well way over more than one movie's worth of stuff into one movie. Um I think it was fine. I did notice that they repeated plot points from or like uh plot story parts of the Cambellian journey from both Empire and Jedi into the same story. Um, but in terms of the pacing and things like that, I did not have a problem with that in particular. Um, I mean, there I mean, are I'm issues. Not as cr I'm not as cruel as the people who say this feels there, like a six act movie, but there were issues related to the fact that one of the main actors got halfway through production, or maybe less than that, but halfway through if you include the the archival footage, and then was not able to finish the rest of her role. Um, um if you're that talking about she was, a major she was actor guys. There. If you're talking about a certain Carrie Fisher, she was never there. Yeah, yeah. she she it was all was, archive. It was all, I was under the impression they had started filming. No, no, maybe she, not with she her. died before. She died before Last Jedi came out, and these yeah, production okay. cycles have basically been. Last Jedi went into production pretty much after 
um, Force Awakens came out, so they only had like two okay. years. Okay, she so actually died so thing. early in the Last Jedi before Je Last Jedi came out that they literally could have edited her to be gone. So yeah, okay, so but, they, so but but JJ Abrams said that he thought he decided he had enough archival footage from Force Awakens. Supposedly, yeah. So I'll say that a lot of people are saying they should have recast Carrie. I think it would have taken me completely out of the movie. I preferred them yeah. using the archival footage. I think I think they managed to work it in well enough, but there were plots where you could see okay, Carrie should have been there, but they had to do yeah. some sort of hokey work around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that kind of stuff I weren't like take because it's very clear that this was probably supposed to be Leia's movie. Mm -hmm. Oh shit, she's dead. Leia's big final movie, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and we don't want to CG her or anything, right? So, like, not, oh, not, well. not, 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 yeah. not after, not after the stink with Rogue One. <laughs> Which yeah. I don't see. I don't understand that stink. That was it was a little weird, but it was perfectly fine by my book. Hmm. I mean, I have more issues with Tarkin because he just yeah, Tarkin really looked a lot more fake in the room. <laughs> Um, yeah, like with me, um, I mean, I'm, I'm still of the opinion that Leia should just not have been in the movie because I, it's like they had to just, I think that would have been worse kind of because forced. that would have meant that every, every, uh, returning character got a movie that heavily focused on them except Leia. I mean, yeah, to be fair, this all one the male characters so. get a lot of emphasis and then none of the, and then the one female character does not. Yeah. For me, at it's just the, like, at the, I didn't at the like same time, answer. putting her on a bus like that because the actress died is understandable. Mm -hmm. oh, by the way, we're at five minutes and a half. <laughs> hey, Matt, hmm? I forgot to add something to Geek Talk. Could I go ahead and do that? Sure. All right. It so, would have been an. I knew there was something I wanted to put in there. I forgot. It was what I removed from it last week. And that, and it was only because we were oh, talking so Star Wars that I wrote. No, no, I'm not done with it. Um, no, it's uh, what I was going to talk about last time, but decided to wait until after I'd seen the last episode. And that is The Mandalorian. Ah. Oh. I am. Mm -hmm. I still need to finish that. Mando. Yes. So, mm -hmm. as you know, uh, or may not know, Mandalorian just finished its first season run on Disney+. Plus. Uh, I was not looking for free trials. I was um, not expecting to watch it right away, but since Aaron purchased us a year of Disney Plus, we've gone ahead and watched it, and I have thoroughly enjoyed nearly every episode. A couple of them were a little mediocre, but none of them were outright bad. Mm -hmm. um, the character himself of the Mandal of the Mandalorian, aka Mando is actually pretty cool. A lot of people compare him to Clint Eastwood. I compare him more to Snake Plissken. Um, he's a bounty hunter out there. He's basically getting the job done, but he usually finds himself, you know, in a relatively horrible situation and has to get out of it some very sneaky ways. Hmm. Um, you have Taika Waititi playing IG-11 in a couple of episodes, who is a bounty hunter droid. And if you know anything about Taika Waititi, he is hysterical no matter what he does. <laughs> uh, they let him direct the final episode, and the opening scene comes out like you'd expect something from Thor Ragnarok 2. It's literally two stormtroopers <laughs> talking to each other, and it's just a stitch. I'm laughing my ass <laughs> off. It tires me. Yeah, that's the scene where they made the fact that they can't hit the broadside of a barn cannon. Yes, yes. They're they're basically they're <laughs> idly waiting to go into town, uh, for clearance to go into town. So while they're waiting, they decide to shoot this piece of idle machinery, and neither one of them could shoot it. And one of them's, you know, looking at his gun, shaking it, trying to figure out why it's not shooting right. <laughs> It's just a great, it's freaking hysterical scene. I, I saw that scene, I'm like, dude, just give him a whole movie. Give him a whole <laughs> Star Wars movie and go run with it. He needs I mean, to make the Star Wars comedy film, film that we need. Yeah. As far as I know, they're focusing more on standalones now, so hell, why not? It's possible, um, yeah. But the, the, it's a great story. Um, there's a lot of guest appearances by, by people because... You know, they he kind of goes to various planets trying to hide from the bounty hunters that are trying to kill him. I believe, um, yeah, Bill Burr uh, features in a couple of episodes as a sharpshooter. 
uh, in one episode. I heard also, for sure one of those, but possibly more. But yeah, uh, nothing in there's nothing only in one this okay. season. Yeah, um, Clancy Brown's in it in one season or in one episode. Um, it's there's just a cast of of various characters, a few of which make repeated appearances, um, and then a few of them are just one shots. At least at this point. Um, the bad guy is great, and I'm not going to spoil who that is if you haven't seen it. But uh, the 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 final bad guy is great. The last thirty seconds, you're like, oh holy shit! So yes, you want to see more of this. This is, in my opinion, this is the best Star Wars that's come out in a few years. I've not, I wasn't that happy with Force Awakens, and I was not happy with Last Jedi, but. Mandalorian brought some of. I was basically saying at that point, I'm done with Star Wars. So, I but I have to ask, seeing yeah, go ahead. I have to ask, seeing some of the reactions, is it basically the Baby Yoda show, or is it actually focusing on the Mandalorian? It focuses on the Mandalorian. Okay, hmm. Baby Yoda is Baby Yoda character. is just so highly memeable. Yeah, he's highly memeable, and the there he the Baby Yoda is a question: Where did it come from? Um, what is it there? And well, I mean, when a, when a Yoda and another Yoda love each other very much. Actually, we don't know if they have that ability. <laughs> yeah, we know nothing about that. We don't even know the race name. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I want. That's to why stay it's called that Baby way. Yoda by the fans. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we don't know where the baby came from. We don't know where its home world is. Where it's that, and uh, all he knew is the fact that uh, the Empire were going to. Uh, abuse it or the remnants of the empire so he basically took it under him under his wing and that's most of the the plot of the series is him hiding from the bounty hunters that these ex-empire goons are sending after him Hmm. as he's trying to figure out what to do with the the baby or the child as they call him (laughs) um i I believe the number one thing i've heard this referred to as is lone wolf and cub it Mm. is kind of lone wolf and cub but it's it's about both of them. Mm-hmm. But you get some real focus on the Mandalorian, his history, the fact that he's a foundling and not a true child of Mandalore. Um, and they go into some more detail on what the Mandalorians are as kind of almost like a religion at this point. It's a code, a creed. Yeah, the I think gist they use I get the- is that it borrows a lot from the Karen Travis interpretation of Mandalorians. It could very much, but right mind you, this is done by the same guy that did Rebels, um, and I think did a chunk of Clone Wars. So he's basically the one that's been doing the Mandalorian stuff throughout all of the Disney, um, run. As far as writing, you mean? Because the yes. showrunner is John Favreau. Yeah, and Favreau was behind Rebels. Favreau huh. was. Um, on the staff for Clone Wars, but I'm not, I don't think he was lead, but he, I think he did the Mandalorian stuff. But so, yeah, this has been his baby and he's running with it. And rumor has it, he's, he's might be on tap for doing more in the regular movies. That's, hmm. that's definitely a theory going around. But if if so, I mean, if it comes out like this, it's worth it. Oh, mm-hmm. by the way, uh, the fact is that they got for there is a scene that has a like I said, there's a, these ex Empire guys, and they're still using stormtrooper uniforms. So they had a scene with a whole bunch of guys in stormtrooper uniforms. They got the five o first to do it. Mm. <laughs> if you don't, nice. yeah. I'm sitting here watching an episode with them, and I'm like. Okay, that's a 501st. That's a 501st. That's a stunt guy. <laughs> that's a stunt guy. That's a regular actor because he's speaking. That's a stunt guy. And those are 501st. You know? <laughs> if they're standing around or they're moving from one place to another, it's 501st. If they have to take a fall, it's a stunt guy. <laughs> but still, it was kind of awesome that they did that. There's also another scene where there's some New, uh, New Republic uh, X Wing pilots. They're all played by the various directors for the series. Ah. Oh. Except, so the... For, except for Favreau, who has another character he does, and Taika Waititi, who does IG-11. <laughs> so the theory that it's set before Return of the Jedi has been debunked then. 
Oh, yeah, it's about nine years yeah. after the Battle of Yavin, so it's about five years after Return. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's set between the originals and the sequels. Yeah, it's basically the New Republic is uh, a thing, but the galaxy is still pretty much a chaotic mess after the collapse. If I, of the if I heard this correctly, yeah. matter of fact, uh, Tatooine has essentially stormtrooper helmets on pikes, do they not? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then <laughs> and one well scene on, on the main on the main world they're in, um, they uh, are roasting one of those monkey guys that Jabba had as his uh, uh Kowakian monkey yeah. lizard. That's that. Yeah, they're roasting one of those. <laughs> I'm just like, whoa, the world's gone weird. Tatooine got <laughs> dark. <laughs> well, no, it wasn't Tatooine. It's the the there the, the he's not based on Tatooine. He's based mm. on another world. There is a episode that they go to Tatooine. Yeah. But that's briefly because his engine broke down and he needed to get it fixed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it looks like basically the Empire is gone. It looks like the huts have been cleared out. Because there's a lot of places you see with huddy, with huddish architecture, but are not in the control mm. of the huts. So either mm. they've been they're gone or they've far been reduced in the size of their influence. Oh, I should have yeah. keep better track of this. Yeah, we're at nine minutes now for this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Either way, Stop. watch the if you've got Disney Plus, watch the Mandalorian. If you've got a chance to borrow somebody else's Disney Plus account, watch the Mandalorian. I right. yeah, I need to find a way to see this. Anyway. Uh next item was Oh actually uh, should be, should Yeah, be should we go into uh, uh, Review of Shame? So that's me again. All right, so um, unicorn and the uni wasp. Yep, unicorn and the wasp. Um, so what to say about this? It was a good episode. I liked the way they used the mystery format. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, even while watching, I was trying to find the come up with something I could really say that I disliked about it. Um, and other than it might have been nice if they kept the wasp reveal until a little later to amp up the mystery aspect. Um, but other than that, I think especially the writing was very tight. Um, acting was well done. Um, I think it lacked that certain, like, indescribable something to push it to being a 5.0 episode. Um, but I guess it can fit with uh, 4.5s because I really can't think of anything to take points away from it for. All right. And then you agree with Tim on that then. <laughs> Um, it was between a four and a four point five for the rest of us. Yeah. Matt and I gave it fours because we didn't like the actor that played uh, the vicar. Mm. Yeah, yeah. When, he has some when, very when silly he, When he went wasp and that that silly bzz, 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 bzz thing was mm -hmm. just kind of. Yeah, cheesy. he went. He went too. Oh hammy. yeah, I got you. <laughs> it's probably RTD. No, you need more ham. Yeah. <laughs> it was a bit more camp. You need to camp mm -hmm. it up. So that will uh, Bill's vote will raise that from a four point two for a four point three. Um, hey, raise the roof. So Ooh. that will take it in the rankings from uh, number one twelve oh. to number ninety seven. So it'll now be above the top one hundred. I guess my my favorite scene probably would be the scene where they figured everything out because it was just so perfect. Mm -hmm. mystery novelty um least favorite scene would probably be how they got rid of the wasp because it went from i, I don't know it's just, that too it wasn't all that creative yeah that was really yeah. lame and yeah i guess that's about all i can come up to say unless you have any questions about what i thought about anything no not really um mm -hmm. I mean, you know, please see the uh, the actual podcast we did, which was on the yep. 11th of December. And that puts Bill back on par for the season, but still loads behind and in I've, the previous one. I, I, I've <laughs> set myself the goal of catching up with all of my reviews of shame by the end of 2020. <laughs> so. we'll, we'll see about that, Bill. We'll see. You, you, <laughs> you realize, Bill. That means you're... one a week through most through at least the beginning of the summer. You realize, Bill, you never did a review on the Battle of Rangscore Avcolos from last yeah, series. Yeah, that's on my list. <laughs> Are you um, yeah, you I, think that's, I think that's the most outstanding one <laughs> you have, is Rangscore Avcolos. Uh, 
but that started there's one from before that. I'm looking. That torch you did you have a torchwood missing from the same seat. Hmm. Um and everything else I'm seeing is ones that we that uh nobody had votes on, so yeah. The Rand score of Kalos looks like the last one that you're missing. Or the first one you're missing. Torchwood from that, and then a buttload from last season. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So are we on to our last bit of today? We're up for uh we're up for the spoilers. We are up uh, yes, to time to yes. talk about new elements of yes, Doctor Who. Yes, we are going to talk about the elements, elements yeah. of Doctor Who. And before that, everything <laughs> after this in the podcast is now into spoiler territory. Yep. So if you're, avoiding spoilers, if you're avoiding spoilers, close the episode, go to bbcamerica.com, which is probably up there by now. Watch the episode and come back. As long as you've or got cable, if you're American. Purchase it off of Amazon Prime or whatever access you have to getting uh, media, because that's where it's all going to be. Anyway, so elements of Doctor Who. This is not a usual element we have, but hmm. let's talk about the new spoiler master. Dun, dun, dun. One, one thing I was wondering if they're confirming whether this is the new master's face or whether it's a disguise. That I couldn't tell you. But yeah. it sounds it sounded to me like he killed the original guy and replaced him. Mm-hmm. But yeah. didn't change his appearance, mm. which is interesting. Which is interesting because I mean, the doctors met this person, so I don't know if this is a case of like intentionally regenerating to look like the guy. No, met this person while they were working for MI6. He said that he replaced him on the on his way into his first day of work. Mm. So when mm. the doctor met this person, they met the master who was good. Oh, at- okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so it was just that the record it's, was... It, it was a long mm. con. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the master's stick at this point, so... Uh-huh. Mm. As the masters want to do. So is this like uh, the generation of Missy? Possibly. It seems Apparently, that way. It, it's, um, it we can't confirm. So... For all we know, there's another five regenerations in between. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for the best mm-hmm. that we know, it is. Yeah. As far I mean, as we can we tell. knew the master was going to come back at some point. So. Yeah, we just weren't really expecting him to come back now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The master always has an escape pod. Mm-hmm. I was now, expecting. That... I, I was expecting next year. No, because that's next year's, mm-hmm. that next year's the master's fiftieth anniversary. Mm-hmm. So I was expecting him to make an appearance next year. That said, with Missy having been mentioned, I do kind of get the feeling from this episode, much as you get with like the early Tenant and early Smith episodes, that this episode was written without knowing who the new actor was going to be, or at least the the specific scenes, the specific reveal scene was written without knowing who the new character uh, actor was going to be, and just written for Michelle Gomez. Uh, I don't think so. I think mm. it was written generic master because there was a yeah. there was some John Sims ish in there. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, and uh, I guess you could argue in the way it's like it <clears throat> almost. I don't know why, but maybe it was just the whole sort of giddy, campy reaction to the re- like the reveal also felt a bit Anthony Ainley. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that's. It, I think it was written generic master, mm. um, not really. And the thing is, you know, I've always said Missy came off as kind of a female Anthony Ainley. A lot of mm. her expressions were the same as Ainley's. Um, I, but I, I think she was why. a little more sinister than Ainley. At times. At times, yeah. yeah. Or at least she was allowed to be. <laughs> well, when she came out, nope. she was completely and totally on Dari. That's... That said... Um... Was Ainley the last time before today we saw tissue compression? Um, yes. Yeah. I, say, I think so. I John think it might Sims have been never referenced. Used it. Yeah, I think it might have been referenced since, but <clears throat> hasn't actually appeared. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we ever actually saw Ainley use it. No, wait, we did oh. Megapolis. 
Yeah. 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 And yeah. Uh, Planet of Fire, he somehow does it to himself and doesn't die, which is weird. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what the master does something fatal to himself and doesn't die must be Tuesday. <laughs> he saw himself on fire and somehow didn't burn to death from that either. Oops. Oh no, no, uh, yeah, like I was get, like he shrinks himself somehow with it, but doesn't die because of it. It's like okay, but mm-hmm. yeah. Well, we may just mm. think he's dead, but somehow he manages to come back because, you know, mm. he's basically um. made of will and evil. Um. <laughs> Which I will say, I hope that's, I honest to God hope we don't get an explanation. Like, I kind of like the idea of with Anthony Ainley, he just kept coming back and it's like, well, fuck you, I'm back. Who cares? And it's <laughs> like, yeah, honestly, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's just roll with it. I don't need like half an episode worth of explanation on how the do- on how the master came back. It's like they're back. Cool. <laughs> uh, actually, it doesn't even need that. It, like literally, all the explanation the master needs to give is, "You fool! I used an escape pod. How else do you think I escaped?" <laughs> but okay, so what do we think of what we see of this master as opposed to this masters? Let's not get off topic. Mm-hmm. Mm. Hmm. It's kind of hard to judge because you only really get the one scene, mm-hmm. really. But you get I a few like different the... moods during that scene, but yeah. Yeah, yeah he seems to be yeah. a nice yeah. wide collage of some of the previous masters. I'm waiting to see what he does yeah. with the rest of an episode, now that he's revealed mm. himself. It does seem to be that he's doing a bit of a backslide. I mean, the... Oh, yeah, yeah, he definitely... Yeah, as we're going... Very Sims-ish in mo in yeah the whole um the whole uh becoming a hero arc seems to have ended. been dropped yeah mm-hmm. yeah mm. well it's a regeneration we don't expect everything from Missy to stay sadly yeah yeah I'm oh. back in evil baby yeah, yeah like, <laughs> okay. um and speaking of comparing to Missy so I've been going back and forth as to how I, what I was, what my hopes were for the new master. Um, I have this fear that um, they'll now that they've done one female master, just do a ton of men and be like, Oh yeah, that was just a one-off. And I'd much rather it be like, no, you know, the gender is random or whatever. And kind of stick with that as being going back and, you know, so Not necessarily having... back and forth, but yeah, just like, don't yeah. always just keep completely do it one side of the coin. Right. Yeah. I, I'm also afraid that they're going to be like, oh, well, last last time was a woman and this time is a man of color. See, we're, we're clearly very diverse and just like without any more <laughs> thought to it. Cause that's yeah, just, just, that scream, just, uh, just scream, yeah, just scream the word it. diversity and expect yeah. everyone's going to clap, you, even though if it's an actor that doesn't fit the role well. That's a way to piss the left off, piss the right off. Here I am stuck in the middle with you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't know what oh. else to do. Uh Let's see, who is, uh, let's see, what was that character's name? Oh. Oh, okay, so that's yeah, Sasha he, uh, his, na- his nickname is O. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's the new master, is Sasha Dewan. And I swear I've seen him in stuff before, but I can't place him. Um, let's see, I'm trying to figure out what I might have seen him in. If I've ever seen 24 live another day. Oh, he was Davos in Iron Fist. Oh. Oh. Oh, shit. He was also so we in know an adventure he can... in space and time. So we know he can play a bad guy. Oh, yeah. He was playing Waris Hussein in Adventure in Space and Time. Yeah. I didn't even recognize him. <laughs> and it wasn't that long since I watched Iron Fist. Right. Oh, so yeah, like look looking at his IMDb picture, I immediately peg him as Davos before anything else. But... Well, that's cuz that's him circa 2010. Mm-hmm. Um mm. or actually no, that's his that's his wiki page. Um what's his what's his IMDb one? Um Oh yeah, okay. He's got the beard and everything which i don't think he has in doctor who 
he has a, a he has a bit of scruff in mm. that, but not mm. a much. He has the unshaven look. <laughs> um, but yeah, he was he. I mean, we oh. just watched him in Iron Fist, you know, last uh, two years ago now. Twenty twenty, oh, right? Remember? Yeah. I ironically, <laughs> he's in. Um, I don't know if that's right. Well, coincidentally, I should say he's in Moffat's new Dracula. <laughs> Really? Mm. Well, apparently, yep. apparently he was in an episode of Sherlock, so ha, ah. that would kind of fit. Mm-hmm. Oh wow, yeah. So yeah, uh, we know this guy can do sinister because Davos mm-hmm. kind of went off the nuts sinister. Oh, he stuff. was he was in that shitty Will Smith Shyamalan movie. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I forgot that was the thing. Thanks for reminding me, Bill. Yeah. The, literally, the only thing I remember about that movie, other than, it's that other than that, um, Jaden is in it. Is that? Um, Are you talking after, that After Earth? Yeah. 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 Is that it proves that M Night Shyamalan can suck the charisma out of any actor? Yep. <laughs> yeah, Will Smith was basically wood in that. <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, he does have a good list of, of sources, and we have seen him do Sinister before. Yep. So this yep. actually bodes well. Yes, this actually does bode well for him playing a good master. And the fact that we didn't recognize him shows that uh, he had, can you know do a bit of a range, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he completely yeah. fooled us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I saw him in uh, Adventures in Space and Time, and I totally did not recognize him. Yeah, I didn't recognize him from that to Dav- to uh, Davos. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is that's. I think this is a good a good a good go. I think he if they're going to yeah. keep him as the master to show up every now and again, this is going to. I think this uh, this has potential. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because I think it's like it, it really will be more so the part two to judge him by because I feel like. Given how that scene ends, it's more like he was all giddy to start with, but gets more serious in the end bit. So it'll be like, mm-hmm. see well, how it, it, the portrayal like, carries over. It's like him enjoying the finally the payoff, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And having having to do this long game. Yeah. And then finally being able to go, yes, I finally did it. Of course, he is counting uh, a bit ahead of time as he's like, I finally got you. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Uh, and every yeah, time you not. shout, "I finally got you," you always somehow foobar. Yep. <laughs> so well, I, I mean, I am kind of wondering if we, if we, if we're going back to the Ainley kill the doctor. Uh... uh, I think we're going back farther. I think we're going back to the Delgado team up with an alien race and then get betrayed in the last part. That's a possibility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, these uh, laser light beam guys will suddenly turn on them. <laughs> We'll go into that in a, in a little while. <laughs> God, you know, though, the, them revealing the master now makes me wonder, the Jaduna coming back, will that have anything to do with them now? We don't know. We'll have to see. That almost makes me think you're suggesting that that almost makes me think of an of an entire season about the master. Well, no, we just the uh 12th Doctor kind of had entire seasons about the Master, so we wouldn't want to re- revisit that territory again. I don't know. <laughs> this, this, if if they do that, that would almost make this back to third Doctor, um, back to um, the third Doctor era where the Master was the villain yeah. each one. Yeah. But mm-hmm. if they are using the Master to tie the episodes together, I'm actually for that mm. because if it's one thing that Series 11 didn't have was something to tie the episodes together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They kept yeah. getting little which, references to Missy, which, but they never really tied it together until the very end. Which is kind of funny because at one point mm-hmm. we uh, not, not had, Missy. We had received no. rumors that it was basically going to be a 10-episode serial. Mm. Mm. That's true. They were kind of hinting at that, weren't they? Uh, this season? Yeah. No, the last uh, season. Previous. And it turned out to be completely wrong because yeah. it turned right. out to- Ten episodes yeah. of disjointedness. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I, I wouldn't tied mind together was the first and last episode. Having, I wouldn't mind having a little more to tie it to tie it together. 
Because mm-hmm. I think yeah. that's part of the reason last season lost so much momentum is it just kind of felt disjointed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Or even if like he's not in every story, like every other something story, like so that. Like, just yeah. just enough that we let them know that the master's an ongoing threat. Yeah. yeah. Not just a one and done. If they make mm-hmm. him a one and done, then I think we're gonna see this start losing steam. Yeah. Anyway, let's actually start talking about the episode. And so that means we need a summary. Whose job is the summary? Well, yep, my name is on the list. <laughs> yes, Bill, your name is on the All list. Right. Are you ready, Bill? <laughs> I think I'm ready. Let me get, give me a countdown. Three, two, one, go. Uh, the Doctor and Companions are back home, um, giving everybody flimsy cover stories about what they've been doing. Um, and we learned that um, at least, uh, what's his name, Ryan is a particularly bad liar. Uh, but all of them are met by um, silent figures in black standing by uh, very official looking cars, which in some cases bolsters their backstory, in some cases not so much. Um, but they are all picked up, including the Doctor, um, and they're all thoroughly confused and consider themselves to be kidnapped. So I guess the people picking them up did a very bad job of explaining anything whatsoever and made them think that they were in the beginning of the Matrix or something. Um, on their way to whatever's going on, the GPS turns around and shoots a laser at the driver, killing him. The doctor tries to take over the car as she's in the best position to do so. And the car just decides, no, we're going to drive backward at 80 miles an hour on a crowded road to drive you over a bridge, uh, which the doctor eventually manages to stop by using a mirror to stop the lasers that keep shooting out of it. Uh, they eventually realize that MI6 was trying to recruit them. Um, they drive over to MI6 um, and discover that intelligence agents from across the world have been basically being uh, targeted and transmogrified by an unknown source. Uh, the doctor agrees to look into this, and then the leader of MI6 is killed. Uh, then they then go on to find uh, Agent O, who is the one person of MI6 who knew anything about uh, non-mundane affairs such as aliens and the supernatural um, at a time when UNIT and Torchwood are no longer available to help. Um, so the team splits up uh, with two going to check with O and two going to look at the, um, to meet with the head of not Google to figure out his role in all of this as all of the intelligence agents were uh, trying to learn about him. Um, so as the group split up, they do manage to get some dirt on head of not Google and find that he's only 93% human and is working with uh, these aliens that uh, had attacked MI6 HQ and the TARDIS. Uh, they also attack O's home. Uh, G- Yaz is attacked by one of them, seemingly killed, uh, but somehow this ends up teleporting her to O's home. Uh, prior to this, the alien that uh, had attacked them and had been kind of captured by the doctor revealed that they were uh, essentially trying to invade that universe and were basically, uh, they also got information suggesting that these were alien spies. Uh, They confront the head of not Google about this to figure out what's going on. He jumps onto a plane. They follow him onto the plane. Um, On the plane, the head of not Google disappears. But what they do find is that O is secretly the master and that they are in some sort of trans-dimensional space. Uh, and cue cliffhanger for the next episode. All right, that was three minutes and about 28 seconds. All right. It, al- it always feels longer. I felt like I was like, <laughs> I must be at six minutes. I need to just hurry up and get to the end. And I feel like I've done it in three, and it turns out to be six. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so let's talk about what we liked about the episode. And Matt, you are first. Ah, well, la di da. Um, 
I love the feel of this episode. Uh, the 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 they 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 play the spy theme pretty nice and well, but they still throw in enough of the sci-fi that you still feel like you're in Doctor Who. Yeah. And I also speaking of the feel of of uh, of uh, spy thriller, I love the little pseudo nod of Doctor No theme that they play just as they're walking up to the <laughs> casino party. <laughs> I heard it a mile away. I'm like. Oh, I wish I could have that for the uh, opening for tonight. Oh well, <laughs> I'll I'll make do. All right, Thomas, what about you? Uh, I really want to go for the obvious, but I'm gonna leave it for someone else. So instead, I'm gonna go with the fact that Yaz had something to do. Yes, thank mm-hmm. God, finally. <laughs> she had something to do, and she had someone to talk to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she got, like, hell, the, like, she, yeah, she gets to show range. She gets to show, well, yeah, I'm a cop. Or at least, you know, trying to become a cop. She, so she, she also I shows, yeah, she shows her a little bit of a cop thing because she's like, I can do this undercover thing. Brian, please relax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, my God, thank you, finally. She had, like, one episode last, last series where she was supposed Kind of, you figured she would have the focus, but even then, it's not really. And yeah. then now it's like, oh, thank God, they managed to actually. I would even say, oh, well, actually, no, I won't, because that might be someone else. But if someone else doesn't, I'll bring it up in at the end. But yeah, All right. like, thank you. We finally got yes, 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 something to yes do. I will agree. This, the, yes, so they finally did something with her. Uh huh. All right, Bill. Um, I like how they address the fact that getting rid of unit was a bollocks idea and that the government is suffering for it and that there was one guy who could have helped fill in that spot and that they dropped the ball on that too. Um, so basically you're liking the government incompetence. Kind of like <laughs> the fact that they're like they're they're addressing that and like they're not just going back to oh the government pretend you know doesn't know aliens exist. They're like they know they just it's kind of like the internet in 2019. They know the internet exists. They just drop the ball on it repeatedly. I mean, we don't know. Is... We don't know what to do about this. We're just this... going to ignore it until and hope that the fires go out. <laughs> this is, you know, a universe where the Earth is invaded or attacked. You know, almost every other week, usually twice a year. <laughs> at, at least Especially twice a year, if not Christmas. every other month. <laughs> every Christmas. So every you Christmas. know the, the mentality of disbanding unit always was like the hell these are your front liners for alien invasion and you're getting rid of them and then of course torchwood is gone and now you're telling me that you fired the one guy that actually believed in aliens on your staff (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) somebody's rustling rappers that'd be me because i'm getting rid of something i sat on I moved in. I moved back, and I heard something rustle. I'm like, "Oh, that shouldn't be there." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but yeah, you you know, it's like, Jesus, how? Mm-hmm. I mean, who's running this country? Boris Johnson. Oh, this is before <laughs> okay, Boris. Okay, never yeah. mind. <laughs> <laughs> the guy can't even separate from the EU properly. So no, I don't expect. <laughs> Actually, actually, this is still technically before Boris. So, who was the previous prime minister again? Theresa May. May. Theresa May. Who was who just only marginally better. <laughs> Either way, I don't know. Loaded... She wanted to bring back fox hunting. <laughs> Either way, we're looking at no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Tim. I just love the pacing of this episode. Uh, like it when it hopping from like locale to locale and scene to scene, and just like from like one storyline where you know of uh, Graham and uh, the, the doctor in Australia, and and the other is uh, in San Francisco. And how it just you know like it separates and it uh, 
gets back together, you know, like th- this was a very like uh, like there there was no dead space, I think, in this episode in this episode. And that was a good uh, mm. idea to like uh, start off the whole season with a thing like where there's like no boring parts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And generally it's like it's not them trying to go action, 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 action. It's like a bit of exciting stuff and then a moment to breathe and then yeah. the action stuff again and then a moment to breathe. Mm-hmm. And also, it was like just when you're beginning to wonder, what about the other people? They cut to the other people, you know. The... Yeah. So... They don't focus so much that they lose the balance. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They don't. They they don't leave you half an episode to be like, so um, what happened to Yaz? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or they don't leave Yaz to just follow around the doctor in every scene and not do anything. And act like a hopeless <laughs> child. Yeah. <laughs> okay so what did i like about this i think what i liked about this is the feeling of uh over over the top epicness something that we haven't really felt out of doctor who since i think uh um i want to say um Probably series nine. No, I would say probably the end of series ten is the last time we felt like the episode was a truly epic moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but usually this is a kind of epic that we see in series finales, and usually there's some build-up momentum to it, so. That part I'm a bit worried about whether the whether he's going to be able to follow through on this or whether he's blowing his whole load right here in the beginning of the series and and the rest of the season so something tumbles downhill yeah that's a worry (laughs) yeah Yeah. um but yeah because this has a series a uh, season finale like we saw in like Stolen Earth Journey's End or we saw Mm. in like um. Army of Ghosts, Doomsday. Mm. Um, it has that feeling of, you know, big buildup. And especially with the master reveal at the end, it's just mm-hmm. like, whoa. Yeah. It's not often that they start the series on a two-parter. The last time yeah. they did that was series six, I think. Uh, didn't one of, wasn't, um, uh, was, like, Wizard's Apprentice, which is familiar, a start of Oh, the yes, that was, one? that was actually oh, no. a fairly recent one. That's right, yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a good one. Um... I don't remember what season that was. Wasn't that, that was, eight? That was the beginning. That was nine. No, I think. eight or it would nine. Have been nine, yeah. I believe, because eight was the yeah. season of Danny Pink. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that would have that would have been the beginning of series nine, which was one of our one of one of Moffat's better seasons. Yes. Mm. It had only one major failing, and that was the freaking Mark Gaddis episode, Sleep No More. <laughs> um. Mm. Whereas um, the most, the rest, and some people didn't like the very final episode because it kind of took the build up from the previous one and went sideways with it. <laughs> um, but still. Hmm. Uh, so I will tack on that. The thing that I was going to say, but left out just in case someone else wanted to say it is my god for possibly the first time in doctor who history they actually made three companions work <laughs> right no not for well, the, not first, the time. first time i mean like not like the first time but at the very least to me it's like oh my god they actually at least in new i mean so in the time they really done it in new who but still like this to me was like holy shit they actually made three no, companions they, work in one episode they made three companions work <laughs> once before in new who and that was the uh, in series one when they had <laughs> Rose, 
Jack, and Mickey all in Cardiff. True. Uh, don't for, don't forget Journey's End. That was more than three. That was way more than three, <laughs> but that was true. also a bunch of guest appearances, mm-hmm. essentially. Yeah, that was mm-hmm. that was a lot of cameos. That, that was that was the Infinity War of of the RTD era. That really was. <laughs> That was your Infinity War, Justice League, whatever you want to call it. That was your mm. epic team up of epic team ups because that was three shows coming together for the oh, Doctor. Shit. Who. For that matter, that was that was somebody trying to destroy all universes with an antimatter ray. That was Crisis on Infinite Earths. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> now you could, now you could look at Crisis on Infinite Earths and say for your review. They did this a few seasons, a, a series, a few years ago in another show. It was called Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> it was called Journey's End. And again, was another one of those ones where the second episode of a two-parter wasn't as good as the first. Mm, I still liked it. I didn't say it was terrible. I just said it wasn't as good of a buildup. Had Daleks mm. speaking German. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> In case anyway, you we're getting off topic. The Daleks. Yeah. All right. Moving so we're on. at to what we disliked about this uh, episode. And Matt, again, you're first. Oh, dislike, dislike. I'm trying to think of a thing I did dislike. Um, the effects are pretty spot on. Uh, If I was to point at any one thing that I didn't care for, it was basically how pointless and useless those two cops outside the shack were. Yep. I'm going to have to go with that as well because it's just... just yeah, th- every time we had a, any kind of dollar to convince these people that they really didn't need to be here so they could be, get murdered, it was just like, ugh, just, yeah. just shoot them along. They're obviously useless and pointless at this rate. Yeah. Plus, to be honest, their acting was the only like acting weak point, I would argue, of this entire I, I didn't even worry about their acting so much as the fact that they were just really frivolous characters. And mm. it's just... Uh... But their acting well, was pretty G-Man standard. So. Somebody you know. needed to shoot mm. the aliens. <laughs> you mean shoot at the aliens and do nothing? Mm. Just See, to that's... prove that it doesn't do anything. See, the thing is, you're talking about them like that, and I pretty much saw them. And I just visually imagined the red shirt on them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's basically what they were. As soon as I saw yeah. them, that's why I knew what they were. It's just like, yeah. oh, these poor suckers. I was like, they're, 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 they're the men that the Brigadier tells five rounds rapid to. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Except that at least the Brigadier's could... men would actually run and hide when the, the, things the problem went tits is up. there's no more Brigadier because there's no more unit. <laughs> and these people aren't as well trained as unit soldiers. <laughs> and I guess at the same time, they could also very easily be brainwashed because it's a monster. Actually, so. they might not have been real. For all we know, we don't know what happened here at the end. <laughs> Everything just went sideways. Um, yeah. Although I will also admit, I was I was kind of iffy on one of their accents, and then I realized, then I looked the actors up. Oh, one or both were South African. Not Australian, so uh. that's why their accents sounded off to me. <laughs> that makes sense. Like they so were doing were pretty South- well, but they slipped a bit, so it was like ah. So they were South Africans trying to sound like Australians on a British television show. <laughs> <laughs> or in a word, truth. <laughs> in other words, no. they were products of the British Empire. <laughs> You know, that's just like getting a Scotsman to play a Spaniard in the same movie you have a Frenchman play a Scotsman. You mean or a, getting, a Scotsman you mean playing an Egyptian? Egyptian playing a Spaniard? Yes, that's right. Playing a, a what, Egyptian covering as a Spaniard. I what about a Canadian what playing a Scot? <laughs> what about an Australian playing a Canadian? Okay, I don't know, I don't know what that one's from. Freaking Hugh, Hugh Jackman, Jackman playing, playing Wolverine. Wolverine. Oh, <laughs> right. I see. I don't think he even tries to do a Canadian accent in the movie. Accent in in anything. Actually, I've never heard a, a version of Wolverine that actually tried to sound Canadian. That's because Wolverine just is Wolverine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Make him short, gruff, and badass, and we'll be happy. Mm. Um. Seriously, after this, Google Pride of the X-Men 
and wait for a scene with Wolverine. <laughs> I thought <laughs> I thought he had an Aussie accent in that one. He does, but he's supposed <laughs> to be sounding Canadian. Right. <laughs> he does he doesn't he that's the one where he literally says a dingo ate my baby. No, but no. No, so but it's pretty much what she's not joining the X Men, is she? Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> it's bad. Uh, it's just terrible. It's horrid. Uh, I mean, just waiting the thing for is, someone to call Bruce. Bad part of that. <laughs> it's the only bad part of that thing, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Other than the fact that it was full of eighties camp, but yeah. Uh, anyway, who's next? Yes, who's next? Um, you know what? I was just going to latch on to Matt's, but I do actually have one thing other than the 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 bodyguards being kind of meh. Is, and this is just a nitpick, but it was kind of disappointing to be like, Stephen Fry is in the... Oh. Yeah. They hyped <laughs> up so much Stephen Fry, and he's out in like the first <laughs> 10 minutes he's on. Uh-huh. Yep. I kind of thought he'd be in the background, basically being Charlie to their angels, but no. Yeah, that would have been more yeah. interesting. Oh, well. Instead, they just freaking off the director of MI6. Like, <laughs> like he won't even know a thing. <laughs> what do we think oh, this is? is? Kingsman? <laughs> <laughs> And it, like the funny thing is, after the fact, it was just like, damn, he actually would have been a fun like if they didn't want to bring back, um, uh, K- the Kate Stewart character. It's like, ooh, wouldn't Stephen Fry have made an interesting brigadier? Or what? But, it, just oh, well. just a brigadier like <laughs> character. Just a yeah, yeah. We're in crisis. Call the doctor. It would have been great to have Fry being able to just make guest appearances. Well, now, well, now that he's out, yeah. maybe Kate Stewart will replace him. That mm. would be fucked up. <laughs> have Kate Stewart come in as the new director of MI6 wow. can't say it wouldn't be interesting that being yeah. said this probably opens the door for them going oh shit yeah we should probably have unit exist again that too <laughs> especially or. since MI6 is going to be in freaking ruins after this after this yeah they're, they're like missing half their people and they're uh, like, oh lead, my god uh, they don't have an intelligence agency anymore shit where's those lead directors guys? dead yeah <laughs> Shot they're, in the back of the head. Half our spies are down with their DNA getting changed. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's time to bring back yeah. unit. <laughs> all, all of our spies have had their DNA changed, so we need to reactivate all the Zygon sleeper cells. <laughs> you know, I, I don't get why they dropped unit in the first place. I really don't. It was an excuse to get them out of the way from being able to prevent a, a disaster that the doctor needed to stop, basically. I know, I yeah. know, but it, it's just... Yeah. I mean, the it, is, it is it way too say... shoehorned, but yeah. Yeah, the yeah. logic behind it. Yeah, I also thought it was like just a dig at Brexit, but I don't know. <laughs> I think it was the, equi- the equivalent of breaking the Sonic for for an episode. Yeah, and mm. they took it a little too far, and it's now you got to write yourself back out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. It'd be great if they showed up later in this series. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah that would that would be yeah. like a fun way to like a a fun finale moment is just like unit coming back. All it took was a couple of phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um. So Bill. Um. So I'm going to say that I think that Yaz and Ryan's job went a little bit too easy. Uh, yes, they had the doctor's tech to help them like break into not Google's computer and everything. But if the guy is really like micromanaging and has Uber security and you know is talking openly about how paranoid he is, you'd think he would do a little better job of noticing that people are you know sneaking around his office and things like that before inviting them to come to his house. I'm going to feed on that one. Because I'm going to invoke tech stupidity on this. Mm -hmm. You have a device that's supposed to siphon data from a computer and put it into this portal device, and you're attaching it to the fucking touch screen? (laughs) (laughs) Good point. Very good point. That's very true. Yeah. There's this stupidity in the world, and I'm, I'm sorry, we'll get back to you, Tim. I just wanted to feed off of Bill. There's this stupidity in the world that 
your screen is your computer. Mm. No. Now, I'm using a laptop, so my keyboard is my computer, but I know that the brains are <laughs> under the keyboard in right. this one. And I know that on Aaron's mm. computer out there, the brains are in the tower next to it. Mm. Yeah, so unless it's a tablet, it's the screen is not the computer. Yes. Mm. And I'm pretty it's, sure it's, that... It's the same thing that happens when people cover a camera and think that that mutes the microphone. Yes. The only it's time the... I've ever heard of that being called out was uh, Die Hard. <laughs> ah, no, no. It was um, Curse of Fatal Death. Curse too. of Fatal Death, yeah. No, that yeah. did too. Okay. I can hear you. <laughs> I can still hear you. The microphone is still on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm remembering the scene. But yeah, Die Hard was the only other one that, at least, at least in recent history, that's done it. It's been uh, literally, yeah. It was uh, Bruce Willis's character uh, put the hand over the mic, uh, the camera, and went and uh, asked the guy, a tech guy, a question. All of a sudden, you hear the terrorist on the other side. I can still hear you. He just kind of looks down at the camera slowly. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, it's just one of those it's it's one of those tech, tech stupidity moments mm. where people just assume that what you see is where its brain is. Because in humans, where we see from is where our brain is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh. Although That's I like think, I never I understood I, um, I never ever understood robots um that you kill with a headshot. Yeah, especially, you know, I remember somebody, t a robot talking about its brain being where its tushy should be. That might have been in <laughs> a hitchhiker's thing. I, yeah. can, I can understand it with certain robots, especially if it's like a human-controlled mecha or something. But even then, that's a weak spot that when it's been exploited, they usually come back and go, aha, we have an answer for this. Hmm. All right, so, Tim. I'm going to sort of piggyback off of Thomas, and uh, my problem with the Stephen Fry was not only that it was too, like he was one and done, but when he was on screen, he wasn't Stephen Fry enough. I don't know. I thought he was perfect. But... Mm. I think he was no, perfect I... for the role, but I, I understand where Tim's coming from, too, where he didn't really Stephen Fry it up. But at the same time, I'm not sure that's why I want in that role, either. I, I don't know. Were you expecting them to invite them onto a panel on QI? <laughs> Maybe cuss a bit more. I don't know. Uh... I guess that's just it. He was going for more of a like original brigadier type of vibe than anything else to me. Just not, not like not as like like a bit toned down in comparison, but still, it's like pompous British dude. All right. So, favorite scene, Matt. Favorite scene. Oh goodness, which one do I want to go with? Um, there's actually a lot of really good ones. You know what? Heck with it. I'm gonna say I really enjoyed that bike chase scene. Literally, the guy takes mm. off in a car. They're like, "What are we gonna do?" The doctor looks over and goes, you "Remember that time we went biking?" <laughs> And next thing you know, they're all three borrowing the, that same guy's bikes uh, and just racing after him as fast as they can. Not he even, uh, not, uh, and, and uh, just basically ducking and weaving as the guy is shooting at them while they're still unarmed. Because mm -hmm. that's the doctor way. <laughs> we are unarmed, right. but we're still a big enough threat that you're going to shoot at us. <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> Now, I could go with the obvious, but honestly, I did have one that I liked enough that I was like, you know what, no, I'll leave the obvious one to someone else. Um, y The scene with Yaz and Ryan after Yaz gets teleported to Australia. Mm. And just like, just the, yeah, that like that little moment where Yaz can take in what happened and like how it ends with her just kind of silently crying and it's just like that was a damn good scene and it's like it's one of those scenes was like yes this actress can do stuff if you actually give a shit to do mm -hmm. <laughs> all right and yep. ryan can communicate with her more on a more personal level 
other than asking for her sister's number. Right. <laughs> matter of fact, I love her reaction to that too. <laughs> um, so I'm going to say for my favorite scene, the scene where Ryan and Yaz walk into not Google headquarters and Yaz is being, you know, like doing everything she's supposed to and like, you know, taking control of the situation and Ryan's just like, um, yeah, I'm Logan. I'm Logan. Um, I'm not nervous. I'm Logan. I'm Logan. And she's just like, <laughs> yeah, he's he's an idiot. He's with me. <laughs> Don't worry. He won't be talking much. He's right. just here to take pictures. <laughs> yep. All right, Tim. Well, my favorite scene is uh, the doctor working on the TARDIS at an auto shop with <laughs> it up on the uh, I don't know what that thing is called. The lift. The lift. The lift. That's mm -hmm. it. It's called a lift. It yep. lifts things, so it's called a lift. How unimaginable is that? Well, anyway, <laughs> uh, it, it 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 just like raises so many questions, or not raises questions, but like inspires imagination. Because like clearly, uh, the people who run this shop are like unfazed by I... this person working on a police box. If so, you, yeah, like, if you're talking about the location, I think that's the same garage where the guy got killed at the beginning of last season. Oh, I was wondering that too. It's like it kind of looks like it might have been, but I wasn't sure. Thing. That's what I was assuming. Mm -hmm. mm. It's just an abandoned place that's probably still paid for that they just happen to know about. So it's a good place to meet up. <laughs> Either that, or you know, the doctor's hacked an ownership of it now. That's a possibility too. <laughs> it's technically her little hideaway. That she works on the TARDIS while they're doing their real life stuff. Mm. It's just such an amusing image, I think. I love it. All right. So, my favorite scene is them meeting M for the first time and him assuming the do that Graham is the doctor. <laughs> mm. Because it's that kind of stuff I've been expecting since basically the beginning of Jodie Whittaker's run. Mm. Yeah. Because the Doctor has this established history mm. of it being, you know... A guy a usually man, older. Yeah. Man mm. from, you know, ranging from late 20s to 60s. Mm. And basically fitting Graham's general description. <laughs> that people would automatically assume he being the eldest there, he's the doctor and the others are the companion. <laughs> yeah. Um... So, so they, Ed, I swear to God, Stephen Fry did it right. Cause he just, he didn't, he assumed and just started addressing straight to Graham. Yeah. And they mm -hmm. don't make a big deal. It's like, well, of course the doctor would be a man. It's not that it's just like, well, the Intel we have says the doctor is a man. So, of course I'm going to assume that. And then mm -hmm. Jody's just like, uh, actually. <laughs> and then they just run with it. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's just like, oh, there's, sorry. Wrong information there's just, then. There's, there's <laughs> just an uncomfortable moment and continues. Yeah. Yeah. It was just perfect. I was just like, that's beautiful. Mm. All right. So least favorite scene. Oh, gosh. Um... I don't know. Actually, um, I'm going to go with um, Yaz and Ryan uh, hiding inside the Not Google's uh, facility because wouldn't they have had cameras everywhere and wouldn't the paranoid guy who runs Not Google have noticed them a mm -hmm. lot sooner? <laughs> Wasn't he looking at a video of them? Later, uh, yeah. L later on, he was looking at a video of them uh, mm. hacking his computer, yes. Be yeah, yeah, because they forgot to shut off the camera. <laughs> or at least... But it's like, it how did you manage see. to find a room that's not being bugged and not being watched? Because this guy yeah. obviously keeps control of, like, literally everything in this place. Well, because apparently this mm. is where he talks to the aliens, so he doesn't want it bugged. <laughs> oh, no, that, he still had a camera in there. Yeah, but it's. I'm not, I'm not talking about that room. I'm talking about the room where they came out of. To go mm. to that room. Mm. It still should have been watched like everywhere else because he even has cameras in his own room. 
Oh yeah, there, there are cameras. There's that little bit where they make it. Well, so they make it onto the, the, the hallway and they have to turn one off. off. Yeah, but it's like, yeah. how does the room not also washed? It, mm. it, it it makes me scratch my head that there wasn't more stuff that they had to take care of. Mm. Thomas. Um. Oh. God. Um. I guess just I don't know. I guess just like when the the guards that the master has are just like walking around patrolling and stuff. It's like, eh, they're gonna die. Whatever. <laughs> it's like that's about all I've got. All right, Bill. So, I, this is a kind of subjective and personal, but I'm going to go with the fact where they're like, oh, I know exactly who the right person to call is. I have their number on my text. I'm like, oh, is it Jack Harkness? Is it another character that we know and love? No, it's some guy that we've <laughs> never heard of and sends a picture of a fish. And I don't like it. it you, you're the... The anticipation rises and then it just falls like, ah, oh, it's yeah. nobody we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And my first instinct was that it was the fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was Jim the fish? <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of thought the location was a fish, like they lived, they were in like an underwater base or something. My initial thought was, oh my God, you just managed to get a text guy from somebody who was drowned. <laughs> he's like oh i'm dying right now here's my location oh i've been fitted with concrete shoes and sent to sleep with the fishes this is an automatic response but by, by mi6 <laughs> this is the retirement package oof rough Hard. job <laughs> Rule one of MI6, you don't resign from MI6. <laughs> Nobody leaves the World Wrestling Federation. We, we, don't, we don't have neuralizers here. All right, Tim. Okay, the so least favorite scene. I'm trying, having our time trying to come up with like one scene that I didn't really dislike. Uh, I think I'll have to pass. All right. All right. So my least favorite scene is the doctor uh, basically confronting the CEO about all of this because she's um, basically blunt. She yeah, just... she's, she's a little too much so. Yes. And she you know, also didn't doctor... like, you know what would have actually been a good move for her is if she would have actually pulled out psychic paper or something and went like, yeah, MI6, by the way. I mean, the fact is that, you know, the doctor usually has some kind of subtlety. Or at least you something know? that have grabbed their attention and actually make them open up. Mm -hmm. Instead, she's just like, I know you're doing this. Why are you doing this? And mm -hmm. it's like, really? Mm. He's holding all the cards and you're just trying to pry them out of his hand? Yeah, that doesn't work very well. And that's why he takes off. Yep. That was I just kind of have I, issue, and I think that's the second time I've seen Jody Whittaker do that. And I'm like, I'm trying yeah. to think what what the if if the how what the previous three doctors would have done any different, Psychic other than paper. maybe like having a piece of alien. Usually, they get a little bit of proof first. Hmm. Yeah, either some sort of proof or a psychic paper or something of the like, or maybe even a real official badge that just goes, "Yeah, I'm MI6." Yeah. By the way. Yeah, or it's either they, it's like, or at least the tenant, it would be more like, oh, so, you know, and just bringing it up in casual conversation as opposed to, like, I know what you did. And yeah, he, he they would bring it around to that, but it would be a, a gradual conversation goer rather than just dropping the hammer. Mm hmm. She completely and totally lacks tact. Yep. I was just actually just thinking that. I mean, to be fair, that does seem to be a trait of mm -hmm. her doctor, so. Mm. 
Yeah, hopefully she gets over that go? a little bit. Where did all the tax go? Tenet had loads of tax. Smith had a decent amount of tax. When he was. Sometime on and off, but yes. Capaldi, eh, has it just been losing tact with every regeneration? <laughs> God, that means next we're gonna when get when you get a new regeneration cycle, you have to earn your tax back o later. Maybe yeah, I was gonna say maybe it's just a blonde doctor thing. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oof. I mean, yeah. although I am worried that the next regeneration is going to come out, me, Doctor you, Jane. <laughs> oh I dear. Mean, <laughs> I mean, that said, remember, um. Tenant originally was, oh, I'm rude and not ginger. So <laughs> he, he didn't exactly start off with rude. tact. Yeah. He got mm -hmm. gradually less rude, but he was still very good at, at talking to the villain and, you know. Getting something out of them, yeah. Yeah. Who are you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> And then he went on on a battle rat. <laughs> about All the Lion right. King. All right, so let's talk about our final thoughts about this episode before we uh, close it out. Matt. Uh, so final thoughts is what we're yeah. technically doing? All right. Um, well, uh, they're, they're going to be our semi-final thoughts. Yeah, semi-final thoughts. We, as it stands we'll right now. Talk, <laughs> yeah, we'll probably talk about this episode again next week as it relates to the, the second mm -hmm. part. If, if, you, if you have predictions i'd probably include them in the final thoughts i'm gonna and I'm, I'm gonna include that uh instead of ratings mm. okay mm. gotcha uh, um so final thoughts on it currently standing uh this has been a really interesting episode nice bit of action no boring lulls um lots of good information when we needed it as quickly as possible and out the door we go um nice little nods here and there to essentially the James Bond themes that are borrowing for a good portion of this episode and a very interesting end twist, I think. So I'd like to see where they're going to go with this now. All right. Thomas? I was like, God, you know, I've been stewing in my hatred of <laughs> the Rose of Skywalker for two weeks. And then this episode comes along and I'm like, oh, thank you. Jim <laughs> Nilly, you actually did a good Doctor Who episode. I mean, you know, he's, he's done previous episodes that were like okay. good to okay. Mm -hmm. And then Power of Three, I fucking hate. But, you know, it's like, oh, my God, Jim Nilly, you, bro <laughs> you actually did it like a... I mean, you know, I don't... Hmm. It is curious. I would want to go back and see, is this like... Uh, as far as the Chibnall scale goes, is this countryside good, or is this just better than most of his Doctor Who work good? <laughs> I'm not but, sure it's on the level of countryside yet. We might have to wait till the end of the next episode to find out. Yeah, I don't true. know. It, it definitely doesn't hit the level of creepy. It doesn't hit the same creepy level, yeah. but it might still hit the yeah. same good quality level, though. Yeah, We'll have to wait and see, though. Yeah, it is one of those harder. ones where... Yeah, it is one of those ones where I I am I wanted to as soon as I finished watching this, I wanted to immediately watch it again. And I can tell you that I have not had that sensation for a Doctor Who episode in quite some time. <laughs> so that is like holy crap. Um it's it's one of those things where it's just a fear of is this going to be when part 2 comes out, is this going to be one of those typical new who situations where even if the second part isn't crap it's just like an amazing setup and then a subpar to okay to crap um payoff and it's just like oh i just i just hope they can stick the landing all right is that everything you have to say uh yep bill all right uh so this episode, it was a semi-parody episode. They followed a formula. They followed the formula very well. It was a successful formula. Um, I haven't watched a lot of spy movies, but I think all of the beats that they hit are ones that I was familiar with. So, they, again, they followed the formula. 
of course, they added in that bit of Doctor Who that James Bond or Mission Impossible, et cetera, would not have had. Um, and I think they did that successfully. They didn't botch it. Um, mm-hmm. And they so made it make sense first... inside of a spy realm, too. Yes. Um, so it's a good first parter. Um, of course, the twist at the end um, kind of upends everything. So they're following along with, um, I think this was mainly Moffat's thing of when you have a two-parter, make sure that the second part is radically different from the first part. Um, Which it might be. So this, this is sense. very clearly because we know that next episode is going to involve travel to the past. Um, so I'm curious to see how they how they continue making it worthy of having that Spyfall title despite being a uh, a time travel or historical or both episode and how that's going to involve the aliens. Um, but I think they've done a serviceable part for the first part. Uh, first part, it was entertaining. It kept people's interest. Um, and there's no real reason to complain or to not watch the next episode. I'm sorry. You just mentioned Travel to the Past and all of a sudden the Samurai Jack theme started in my brain. <laughs> Back to the past, Samurai. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Tim. Timothy. Sorry, sorry, I accidentally muted my microphone. That's all right. Welcome back. Uh, anyway, I was so glad to finally be reunited with uh, the Doctor after what seems like forever. And uh, this episode really hit the ground running. Uh, I'm uh, be interested into knowing like more about uh, this current Master's backstory and uh, where this Master fits in the master timeline but uh that was a shocking reveal i as soon as he said i told you you learn how does you should ask who the spy master is my first thought was oh man i should have picked up on that (laughs) uh bad tim Anyway, no, I, uh, I think we all didn't pick it up until he said it, and then we're just yeah. like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But, uh, okay, he- here's my prediction for the next episode. It will be revealed that that sort of in-between worlds that uh, Yaz and the Doctor um, ended up on at both points is actually the Master's scalp. <laughs> like, th- th- they were shrunk <laughs> down and... and, and and those two black things are, are his hair. So what? So what you're saying is that the doctor is going to wind up saving everything with a giant bottle of Selsun Blue. Yes. <laughs> We're also going to find out the master has lice. That would be the aliens, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh. Yes. Okay. Don't mess with Gallifrey and lice, man. Ooh. So, if you remember my reviews for Series 11, there was a lot of times I'm like, well, you know, I can't find any fault with this episode, but it seems to be missing something. And I didn't want to give it a perfect because it was missing something. You guys remember that? It it happened to us a couple times, and we always need to digest it a little bit. Yeah. This had what those episodes were missing. Mm -hmm. It had that feeling of, oh my god, epicness. It just kept you riveted to the screen the entire time. And you're just, you know, going, oh. And then the reveal hit, and you're just like, oh, my God. Yeah, you're. it's just this episode was well-acted, well-written, well-directed. All the special effects were in the right place. You didn't lose interest at any point, And at no point did the characters piss you off. Yes. Yeah. So this is a technically perfect episode, except we've only seen half of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We've just got to hope this is definitely the start of the Chibnall Redemption arc. I hope so. And I hope it lasts all season. All right. Predictions. Matt? Oh, I do pray Matty? for that Chibnall Redemption arc. Uh, predictions. Oh. Um... I'm going to predict that they're in some either another dimension or another, uh, or a like a kind of like a hologram suite or something is where they've really been all this time. 
somehow the master abducted them. Um, also, my another prediction I have, because it did pop up during the episode, is uh, some of that alien coding that they were trying to figure out. So they start you showing multiple Earths. I'm willing to wager that whatever the master is planning has something to do with multiple Earths in different dimensions. All right. No, so Rose and David Tennant are going to show up. <laughs> maybe. And and basically Double collectively kick the master in the dick. <laughs> Why do they keep kicking me in the dick? Why? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and then we get another master of dog bumps. <laughs> um. <sighs> It came up before, but I it, it would not surprise me if this does go back to the um, generally classic Who, but specifically the uh, Delgado era type deal where the master thinks he has control over these aliens, but then it kind of bites him in the ass and he has to be like reluctantly helping the doctor um, hel hel yeah reluctantly helping the doctor to save his own ass and then just manages to piss off um before they can do anything before they can grab him or, get, or gets maybe, grabbed or, he, or gets grabbed yeah. and escapes later yeah which again as i said before that would be an inter like would be an interesting way if he did if he did get captured and held that would be an interesting thing for whatever the Jadoon episode is. Of like the Jadoon coming after the Master for some reason. Maybe. Wouldn't surprise me. Right. <laughs> I'm sure he's done something that's pissed off the Shadow Proclamation. <laughs> Even if they are still working for the Shadow Proclamation, there's nothing to say they are. Right. True. Mm. We Either haven't way. heard the word Shadow <laughs> Proclamation since the Russell uh, date. Yeah, era. technically they are space cops. Oh, wait, cops. no, we've seen them a bit in Moffat, yeah. Yeah. But technically they are space cops, so they could be there for multiple well, reasons either way. They're they're mercenaries, so the Shadow Proclamation yeah. hires them as their army, but other groups They're, they're basically well. rent-a-cops, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, rent-a-cops. <laughs> they're, they're Ogrons with armor and horn. Yep. <laughs> Apparently, uh, they they released those guys into the into the uh, London Underground as a promo thing earlier this month, and just absolutely had people gobsmacked by how good their the prosthetics on those guys are. Were they just capturing people from London? And <laughs> I have no idea what they were doing, but it was a promo for uh, for for this upcoming series. But I saw the video of it, and you know, you saw like little kids absolutely enraptured, and um, just the interviews with people were on how good the 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 freaking rhino mask is. I mean, you know, you think it'd be ridiculous space rhinos, but when you see them, it just totally works. <laughs> well, it's because they did the uh, honestly, the design was already a good one to begin with, and it's just a matter of perfecting the animatronics so it can run around a bit more. Yeah, well, apparently, they've gone through yeah. at least one more generation of perfecting it. Mm -hmm. mm. Anyway, whose prediction were we up to? Bill? Uh, maybe. Yeah, because Thomas. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, okay. I pretty much had nothing else to add. So yeah. So my biggest prediction, like Thomas says, is that the aliens will betray the master at the end. It, I, I almost will be disappointed if they don't. Like <laughs> it's, it's the trope with the master, and it's kind of necessary, especially if the master is there all season, um, which, which we were kind of wondering might be possible. Um, I'm trying to come up with a prediction about that whole everything you know is wrong. And assuming it's not just about the mm. Weird Al song. Um, <laughs> Everything you know is wrong. Black and white so, up is down and short is long. Right. <laughs> so I'm. Please I'm don't, guess... don't mention a Weird Al song to me. I'll sing the entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm trying to figure out what that could specifically be referring to, which might just mean that the aliens are not aliens at all, but they're just like some sort of device that the master made. So maybe that'll be my prediction. <laughs> Uh, and I also predict that Yaz will continue this arc of undercover in some way, especially since we're going back in time to deal with somebody who has the same last name as her. Maybe she'll go undercover as that person in order to preserve history or something. Maybe. Or is that and person an ancestor? Yeah. Ah, 
hard to say for sure. All right, Tim, did you have any other predictions? Hmm. Uh, sorry, no, I, uh, I didn't realize we were going to move on to predictions after we did the final thoughts. So yeah, I, I, we, I we mentioned that, that at the beginning of final thoughts. Oh, I'm sorry. I was that. Um, yeah, I was, I was trying to stop you, but you wouldn't stop. So I'm just like, okay, let him do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So nothing else then, Tim? Uh, my prediction is that uh, Yaz's family will find out who the doctor really is in this. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Hmm. Yeah. We'll see. Mm -hmm. All yep. right. So I agree with Matt that this is going to wind up that the the other the other worlds we saw are basically alternate dimensions, parallel worlds. I do not know if Rose and De and Rose and alternate Doctor are going to get involved, but um, it's still going to be interesting. That would explain those rumors, but still, I'm I, I'm not going to say that for certain. <laughs> um, mm. but yes, I would say that that these alien spies are making a pi a power play not just on this Earth, but on apparently what was looked like a dozen other Earths. Mm -hmm. Um, and that might be where the aliens are kind of overgrowing the master schemes. We'll see. Mm. I still want to see that inevitable uh, turn on the master and see how that goes. Yeah, I really I predict we're going to see more of the doctor master dialogue and really see where this master starts to fit. I'm starting mm. to wonder if next week's opening is going to be yet another version of Curse Your Sudden But Inevitable Betrayal. <laughs> we'll see. All right. Hopefully we don't have to wait too long. Yeah, we only have to wait half a week. Mm -hmm. God, if this was a regular episode and I had to wait a whole damn week to figure this out, I'd be on pins and needles all week. <laughs> As it is, it's technically Thursday already. At, at least, at least it's not one of those. Oh, the season ends in October. This is the cliffhanger for the Christmas special. <laughs> God damn it, CW! All right. Um. So yeah, uh, that's pretty much the episode. You want to close us out, Bill? All right. So yes, please give us your comments below. Um, there's probably going to be spoilers in the comments. If yeah. So let us know what do you think about Spyfall Part 1. What are your predictions for the next episode? Like, uh, like, the, like the video if you like it. Dislike it if you dislike it. And don't forget to subscribe if you're watching on YouTube and to follow if you're watching on Twitch, especially now since uh, we have new episodes to review every week for the next few months. So, yeah, getting, getting us right away is going to be important, isn't it? Subscribe! All right, so next week, if it's not obvious enough, we will be going to part two of this and finding out the answers to all of our questions raised this week in Spyfall part two, which, if I cor remember correctly, is um, written by... Uh, Is it written by Chibnall? Yeah. 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 I, I I couldn't remember if it was written if Chibnall wrote it or if he had if he wrote the outline and had someone else write it. Written by Chibnall and directed by Lee Haven Jones, and starring uh, Jody Whitaker as the Doctor, Bradley Walsh as Graham O'Brien, Tosin Cole as Ryan Sinclair, Mandeep Gill as Yasmin Khan, and of course Sasha Dewan as the Master. See you next week. Mm-hmm. See you then. <laughs>